Castlevania Lords of Shadow Ultimate Edition with Spanish developer Mercury Steam's 2013 DLC included re-release of their 2010 attempt to reboot the franchise. Wait a sec. Castlevania. Castlevania. Did you say Castlevania? Castlevania. So it's going to be something like... Well, no, not quite. It's actually more like... Oh. First off, some people seem to feel strongly that this game should have been developed as an original IP and not as a Castlevania reboot. I think the main argument of these so-called Castlevania purists is that casting the Belmont family in a successful hack and slash format would only reduce Konami's interest in developing another classic 2D entry somewhere down the road. And well, there might actually be something to that argument when you look at how things have turned out for the series since. 2013 saw the release of Mirror of Fate, the somewhat awkward 3DS sequel to Lords of Shadow. 2014 saw Lords of Shadow 2, the proper sequel, and that's kind of been it. To get their Metroidvania fixes then, series enthusiasts have since had to turn to Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, former Konami heavyweight Koji Igarashi's 8th gen console reimagining of Symphony of the Night. Which is pretty good, I hear. There's also that 3rd gen tribute called Curse of the Moon, which I've also heard good things about. Anyway, there's another sort of what's the difference argument the Castlevania purists could offer, which goes something like this. Imagine you didn't play Lords of Shadow as Gabriel Belmont, but as the same character with some other name. Some other name. Let's see. Uh, um, I can't think of anything. Let's just use one of those random name generator websites. Okay, let's say your character was named... Cornelius Davian. All other direct references to the Castlevania franchise were removed in-game, and the word Castlevania was deleted from the title. Would these changes have in any way diminished the Lords of Shadow experience? Well, no, not really. I can't say so. Right, LOS is a good game, but its quality isn't derived from its rather unnecessary positioning as a reboot slash prequel. Okay, so if all else is equal and it's still just as good of a game, then what's the positive argument for bestowing on it the weighty Castlevania appellation? Well, I guess the only reason for said appellation was marketing. Ask yourself honestly, would you have even heard of this game, much less chosen to watch a review of it if Castlevania wasn't the first word in the title? Well, maybe. Yeah, but what would be the odds? Like maybe as in one in a thousand, one in a million? So anyway, for better or worse, it's called Castlevania, but it's nothing like Symphony of the Night or the earlier 3rd and 4th gen console releases. About the only similarities are, you got a whip-like weapon, which is actually this sort of retractable cross thing. You got some werewolves. And early on, you get this clumsy sort of montage to book in the levels, which comes off as a strange design choice until you realize it's supposed to remind you of this map screen from the NES game. Yeah, and that's kind of all you get, so you're probably going to be a little disappointed if you came here looking for more Symphony or more Rondo or more Super Castlevania 4 or whatever. Bloodlines. Yeah, Bloodlines, more Bloodlines. Anyway, no Frankenstein and Igor, no mummies, no Medusas, no Grim Reapers, no Flea Men or Hunchbacks or whatever they're called. Fire Belching Bone Pillars. Yeah, no Fire Belching Bone Pillars either. Minotaurs. Yeah, no Minotaurs. Red Skeletons Red Skeletons actually do make an appearance and they're a pain. They take a lot more abuse than their 2D counterparts and they gang up on you. They also come armed with shields and swords, so they're like Red Skeleton Warriors, not just those defenseless skeleton peasants from the 2D games. They're a lot more like the Stalfos if you're familiar with 3D Zelda. Patrick Stewart 
Yeah, Patrick Stewart narrates the loading screens, which are actually pretty cheesily written. It's supposed to look like Patrick Stewart's reading Gabriel's story from a book. Each little vignette gives you a literary preview of the level you're about to play, so you can kind of key yourself in as you're waiting for the thing to load. A chill wind blows through his heart. I can see it. Feel it. And here's where I should come clean. The main reason I bought this game was because it had Patrick Stewart. But unfortunately, there just aren't really any good lines here. Stewart's a renowned Shakespearean actor, so I was hoping they would have at least written these narration sections in blank verse with 17th century spelling, but no dice. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? He also voices the NPC Zobek, whom Gabriel encounters at various points throughout the game, which is fine, but where's the blank verse? Forgive me. But why are you bringing up Patrick Stewart anyway? He's not even in the original games. Vampires. Yeah, okay, so it's got vampires too, but just hold on a second, we'll get to that presently. We're gonna get filled in on the story first so we can see how the vampires fit in. Darkness has come to engulf one's proud humanity, and we are witnessing the end of mankind. Okay, so there's some kind of weird metaphysical imbalance in the world. Local demonic populations have substantially increased, and we all know how they're gonna vote. You could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. Nah, I think we might be overplaying our hand a little here. After all, what those demons really want is stable jobs, affordable housing, reasonably priced health care, and a decent future for their demon offspring, you know? Come to think of it, no wonder they got such bad attitudes. So bad, in fact, that they wantonly murdered Gabriel's wife, Marie. Yeah, actually, they don't so much as lay a claw on Marie, which is part of the plot twist later on in the story, which we won't discuss any further here to avoid spoilers. But my point is, see how the demons are getting scapegoated here? Right off the bat, everyone just thinks they can blame everything on the demons. So you play as Gabriel, who sets off to investigate the source of the metaphysical imbalance supposedly causing the demon increase. And Gabriel, as it turns out, is a highly skilled warrior and member of a select order of knights known as the Brotherhood of Light. Why have the Brotherhood of Light sent you to the Lake of Oblivion? They have dreamt that a message waits for me at this lake. A message that holds a clue to our salvation. The Brotherhood, yeah, has got a little religious ideology mixed in here and there, which explains their interest in the whole metaphysics thing, which turns out to be more than a little ironic considering there's nothing about this game that's metaphysical at all. Every god or demon or spirit Gabriel meets along his quest turns out to be entirely physical and literal, proven by the copious spattering of blood gushing forth from the NPC's bodies as Gabriel beats them with a chain, his preferred method of social interaction. He even manages to stab a ghost. That's part of a dream. Okay, admittedly that's part of a dream, but you see that creepy mask he's got on at the end there? Early on he learns that mask is going to be key to him resurrecting Marie, but lo and behold the mask has been shattered into three parts, each part guarded by a formidable enemy, and so you can see where this is going. Find the boss, beat the boss, get the mask part, on to the next boss, collect all three, assemble the complete mask, resurrect Marie. But don't expect it's going to be that easy, because get ready for the plot twist right after you've gone through all the trouble to put the mask back together. Oh, and one of those formidable enemies is, ladies, don't try this at home, I'm referring to that outfit, Carmilla, the Vampire Queen. So that's how the vampires fit into the story. Oh. Well, what were you expecting? The funny thing I thought was how the previous boss, the King of the Werewolves, is called Cornell, which always reminds me of the university. You know, it's one of the lesser known Ivy Leagues. Anyway, like I said, we're going spoiler free here, so let's leave it at that for now. But I'll say this about the story. While it might be a little predictable, it certainly offers plenty of content. Gabriel travels to a lot of places, he meets a lot of people. By the end of it, you really feel like a lot's happened and that where you end up is completely different and distant from where you started. So you really get your money's worth out of the story on this one. But what about the rest of the game? Well, like I said, it's a 3D hack and slash, like the God of War games for the PS2 and PS3. 3D. Well, sort of. 3D light. It's one of those games where the camera is fixed at various points throughout the map. So in other words, you won't be needing the right stick in this one, which was completely new to me. At first, I kept trying to move the camera and anyway, it takes a little getting used to. But the cool thing about the fixed camera is as Gabriel moves through the map and one camera cuts to the next camera, it feels like you're going through scenes in a movie and the devs can play with the scale of each scene to create this kind of visual rhythm of progression. You get mostly holistic bird's eye kind of angles for the fights. But then as Gabriel's roaming the environments, they give you these super zoomed out landscapes 
sequence, which look awesome. Or when Gabriel's climbing up a ruined building or out of a cave, the camera's positioned at the ground level, creating a dramatic sense of depth as he moves up toward the top. And different kinds of angles like that. So once you get used to not having control over the camera, there's actually a lot to appreciate in the way they've set up the cameras to view the scenes and tell the story. So let's move on to a discussion of Gabriel's preferred method of social interaction, beating people with his chain. But it's a Christian chain. Yeah, it's actually in the shape of a cross, so I guess that makes it a Christian chain, so apparently it's okay to beat people with it. There's actually a lot of social commentary in this game if you think about it. Go into the basket of deplorables and beat people with the Christian chain. You get two basic attacks, a direct attack which inflicts more damage on one enemy at a time, and a weaker area attack which can hold off enemies if they start to surround you. You also get some secondary weapons, the daggers and holy water from the previous games make welcome comebacks, and the daggers are actually pretty strong in this game, and you can jump. You can also hold LT to block, which I never really did, but if you hold LT while moving the stick, you'll dodge roll in that direction, which is central to getting anywhere in any of the fights, for me anyway. So the basic format of the combat is hit him a few times, look for their counter, they telegraph it, dodge the counter, and then hit him again and repeat that sequence until they're dead. So it's a lot like a 3D version of Punch-Out. There are a bunch of different attack combos you can purchase with XP you earn by killing demons. Some are more useful than others. You just have to kind of experiment, but fortunately, none of them seem to be necessary to completing the game. They're just some extra tools thrown in to spice things up a bit. You also get light and shadow magic, which adds some depth to the combat. Hit L3 to turn on the light magic, and every time you beat someone with your chain, you'll regain some health. Hit R3 to turn on the shadow magic, and each attack you land will deal more damage. You're on a strict magic budget though, and so you'll need to constantly be refilling your magic meters with orbs of essence some enemies drop upon death. And those are the basics. Some people say the combat's a little repetitive, and I can see that when it comes to the droves of grunt enemies you gotta handle, but all the bosses are pretty challenging and well done. They got the different attack patterns you gotta learn, and you gotta strategize on how to deal with their different attack patterns and when to strike them and so on. So I think the criticism would be they could have tightened up some of the levels a bit by removing some of the grunts. But all in all, Castlevania Lords of Shadow is a great game. The word Castlevania in the title or not. Sure, it's a little pricey for a 10 year old game, but you get a lot of content and so for the money I think it makes sense. My advice though as always is to pick Castlevania Lords of Shadow Ultimate Edition up from your favorite online gaming distribution platform during their next seasonal sale. Just put it on your list in the meantime. If you made it all the way here, perhaps you liked the video and maybe you'd even like another. If so, click on a box. One's a video I made that YouTube's decided is most suitable for you personally based on the algorithm's thorough but entirely non-creepy knowledge of your browsing history. The other is just my most recent upload. Or if you really liked the video, click on that enthusiastic looking dog below and he'll lead you to my channel page where you can freely browse all my content. Or if you really, really liked the video, consider subscribing. That way you can take the Buzz in one challenge to non-creepily watch me as closely as YouTube non-creepily watches you.